A few things. First of all, is that we recently have some new printed books. Some of those, uh, some of the new published books are the ones that had been translated in the past, and there's this one new book that. I think it's completely new to all of you. This new book is called um, A Memoir of Dreamlike Life. This is a memoir, rather, contains my diaries of uh, of the journals I wrote about 30 years ago, all the way back from 1990s, when I traveled and paid uh, pilgrimage tours with Ponsu Rinpoche. It's really a compilation of my journal. I somehow kept this calendar um, at Composer Chen Mojo's place for a few years, and then he reminded me of how it was with him, and then uh, he told me that there's a lot of content over there. Uh, do you want to take a look at it? Uh, so I did, and then I forgot about it for a long a period of time again. Later, when I eventually finally remembered it, I started to remember the various aspects and events that happened back then. I tried my best to remember as much as possible. I believe that um, people who are interested in this, uh, you probably would generate um, certain insights or uh, interest at least. Whatever I wrote in there were what happened back then. There were things that happened back then. Our pilgrimage tour to Nepal, Bhutan, and uh, a few places in mainland China, in Mount Ome, and so on and so forth. I did not really record many of the unfathomable insights and spiritual powers of Ponsu Grimboche. Rather, it was more of my personal journal. I think this is really a speck of the sands of the dreamlike world that I uh, remember, therefore. I named it as a memoir of a dreamlike life. I remember that back then I spent quite a bit of money to buy a camera and then try to capture as many pictures as I could back then. If we were to compare to the modern technology, um, what I had back then was rather too humble to be mentioned, and uh, the advancement nowadays is really unfathomable um, for people to think of back then. I tried my best to take as many pictures uh, until to such time that Ponsu Grimboche scolded me for taking too many photos. So now I printed this book, and I'm sharing with all of you of this particular journal. This memoir of the journey I had with Ponsu Grimboche 30 years ago. We traveled to a few different counties um, of Lohor, of Counting, and Temba, and all of those areas. Uh, 
totaling about 72 monasteries. Back in 1985, we went together with Ponsu Rinpoche, uh, 1987 to Mount Wutai, and 1993 to United States, France, Canada, 1997, we then later went to Mount Potala. Though those trips were really good, but I had most of the memory of the 1990s pilgrimage tours, maybe because it was really my first time traveling abroad, so I wrote them down. Not sure if it's going to be useful or meaningful, but I'm sharing this book to all of you. Not sure if we have any extra copies. I hope what I said is not going to be put online. Uh, the, this is really the in-class announcement, so I really hope that this is not going to be um, spread it online on your social medias and so on and so forth because I myself don't really like it. This is something I shared with all of you who are here, not online. This is something that we printed only for reference for our practitioners over here in Larongar and not going to be pro uh, propagated or spread it outside. This is really just a reference in terms of history. So for those of you who are interested, then uh, you can read it. And maybe there are people who think that I don't write well, then uh, you don't have to read it. It was really just uh, some diaries I wrote on a, on a uh, calendar back then, and then later, after 30 years, I wrote them down as a record to remember that journey. So I'm only sharing it with all of you who are here. So I hope that you do not pass it on to the others, don't share it to the others online and so on and so forth. This is very much just a, a reference for you and there's nothing uh, uh, to be shared with people uh, other than uh, the ones in Laronga. So this is the first announcement. And the second, is about the management in Larongar. Lots of our staff members, you're working very well, uh, you're working really diligently. I think in terms of management, in terms of staffing and serving the Sangha, it would be the best to maintain a sense of harmony with everyone. Don't create schism, don't create any conflicts with others. If you were to generate a great sense of anger and uh, lots of quarrels with the other Sangha members, then it's very difficult to say if what you're doing is meritorious or not. Whatever you're dealing with, whomsoever you're dealing with, you have to be skillful and be harmonious with the others. Our staff members, I think the numbers will decrease eventually, especially this year in terms of our management for our students. Um, it seems that people are using this particular post uh, because if you were to staff and uh, serve the Sangha, then there are some extra marks that can be added to your uh, report cards, and uh, it's rather a little bit difficult 
It's a bit difficult to um, maintain a large number of uh, the uh, members who serve the Sangha. And lots of the composing kemos don't really complain about the members staff for the Sangha because I am still alive and uh, lots of the uh, the people don't really dare to say anything negative about them yet. But I think in general, it's quite important to serve the Sangha at the same time, engage diligently in your own study and practice. From what I notice is that people who are good at serving the Sangha, they're usually very good at their own studies and their own practice as well. And people who are not good at serving the Sangha, usually they're not very good at uh, engaging in their own studies and practice. Therefore, later on, we're going to decrease the numbers of staff members and only keep a few. Another thing to address is that we have to abide the rules and regulations and so on and so forth. I really hope that people don't get too excited and crowded whenever we have any uh, lamas or celebrities visiting. I think in Tibet nowadays, people are like that as well. They don't really listen to the uh, teachings. They don't really listen to the lamas anymore. As much as you try to tell them, don't do this and don't do that, they will insist on doing whatever they want anyways. In fact, the genuine dharma is not about whatever uh, blessing touches on your crown you received or whomsoever you received it from. This is not genuine dharma. If you were to grasp onto those external so-called blessings and hold them on, uh, uh, clutch onto them as their dharma, that is not true. When I look at the report cards of the Jomos, of the Tibetan nuns, this time I feel that it was easier for me to inspect their exams uh, during the, the exam sessions, because in the past, whenever the lamas would go and inspect the exams or any of the events, lots of Jomos would then crowd to the lamas and then uh, start asking the lamas to give them blessings and uh, uh, started making offering and uh, uh, staffing their uh, money for rededicated merit into the lamas' clothing. So this is really not appropriate. In fact, the blessings that you can receive really depends on how much dharma that you've synchronized into your own mind, you've taken into your own heart and mind. Therefore, I would like to address and hope that you will listen to me um, and follow the rules as well as take dharma into your heart and not grasping onto any of the external rituals. I remember that the other day I went to the library. I noticed that everyone was doing pretty well. Not overzealous, that is. Everyone's doing whatever they're supposed to do. So that's very good. People with faith, in fact, you can show a sense of sense, uh, your faith through dharma, through the dharma offerings and so on, but not through just overzealous actions and behavior. Of course, there are new lay practitioners who just came here and they have this kind of overzealous attitude. But for those of you who've stayed here for a long period of time, you should try to ease that.
The answer past profound and wonderful Dharma is difficult to encounter in billions of years. I now see it here, receiving and uphold it about to fathom the Tathagata's true meaning to liberate all beings, less generous Supreme Bodhicitta. Uh Sala <laughs> Rissor, you sang. Chadanja <laughs> now let's study the Woodhara Tantra Shastra first. As I said yesterday, there's no class tomorrow. And on Thursday, we will continue with the class on entering the way of the Great Vehicle. In today's class, we're currently studying the fourth chapter on the chapter of activity of the Buddha. In this chapter, we are talking about the uninterruptedness and its spontaneity, spontaneity of the Buddha's activity. So previously, we've already covered the part on the Indra as an example, and then the example of the celestial drum, that's the second. And then today, let's continue with the third example. The third example talks about the clouds as an example. The cloud 
refers to the great compassion of the Buddha. In the previous class, we've covered two verses where it talks about how uh, the clouds would benefit crops. Now let's look at this verse over here. Today, um, we're going to look at the way there is change in terms of the vessel. Clouds are very similar to the water, and the rain that bestows onto uh, the people on the ground, there are the ones who will receive benefit and the ones who would rather feel harm. So let's look at the example and then look at the meaning after. Look at the example, it says that Water that is cool, delicious, soft, and is light when it falls from the clouds acquires on earth very much, uh, very many tastes by touching salty and other grounds. We know that whenever it's raining, the clouds that's pure and cool and bestow the pure and cool water. Because the clouds that's formed in the in the space are made from, for example, the moist the moisture and different particles and so on, and then it would bestow the raindrops. It has all kinds of merits, just as how the celestial water are uh, endowed with all kinds of merits as well. Over here, I'm not sure if it has eight different kinds of merit, but over here it says that the touch or the tactile feeling is that the raindrop is cool. It is not heated, it is not dry, it is rather cooling. And the second property of this water is of sweet. There are different tastes to different water. Over here, this taste is sweet. And then the third quality is that it doesn't harm the body. It is rather gentle. And the fourth one is that it is refreshing as, rain, as raindrops. In fact, it is not harsh. It is not uh, sticky, it is refreshing. And then the fifth one is that it is clean. Sixth, it is not foul. It doesn't have any foul smells to it. And then the seventh is that it is not going to harm your stomach, even if you were to drink a lot of it. If you were to drink any filthy water, contaminated water, then, of course, is going to give you various kinds of harms to your stomach or even diarrhea. And then the next one says that it doesn't harm your throat. Whenever you have um, some sense of unease around your throat, but if you were to drink this rainwater, um, it's not going to harm your throat. So over here it says that such kind of water that um, is poured down from the clouds has all those qualities. That is why there are people who would put various kinds of um, containers to collect the raindrops, and they would drink that, because raindrops would be beneficial and healthy to the human beings as it doesn't bring any f any harm to the uh, human body. In the high-altitude place, like over here, the snow water is also really good. Once, for example, uh, the fresh snow that has not been uh, exposed in sunlight, those are very beneficial, and there are people who use those snow to 
uh, to collect those snow, uh, fresh snow, and then it would make tea from that kind of water. I heard that there are people who would uh, gather the rainwater and particularly make tea from those rainwater. So um, we can see that this kind of a rainwater is, con is um, very much um, considered as beneficial and sweet. However, once the raindrop drops to the ground, especially there are salty ground, then there are different tastes that would generate. In large cities, we see that lots of the industrial um, exhaustion of uh, uh, filthy water those filthy water are mixed with all kinds of chemicals, and such kind of water are definitely harmful to human body. For example, there are various kinds of incidents of causing cancer and so on and so forth. If the water is not purified, and then if we were to intake such filthy water, uh, while it still contains all kinds of chemicals and filth, it would definitely harm our physical body. That is why people buy all kinds of um, water filters. On one hand, I do think that it's beneficial and sometimes necessary. But whenever we look at people who only drink mineral water, I'm not sure if it's necessary to go on to that extreme either. Because the mineral water, you don't really know what are added into those water. Oh, I probably shouldn't say that, otherwise the people selling mineral water probably would dislike my statement. And then uh, the merchants selling those mineral water would be waiting on the way to take uh, revenge on me. But we can see that people nowadays, they try to um, obtain certain better kind of quality of water, but eventually end up with only the inferior type of water. Their water that's uh, renowned for its purity and, uh, uh, for example, the various springs and so on and so forth. In Larungar, for example, the water that we have over here, we tried our best to make sure that the water is drinkable. Now it has met the standard of being a drinkable water, but it's not really the best water. However, the raindrops that's dropping from the sky, from the space, some of the raindrops out of various conditions, it may taste a little bit different. The same type of water that it rains from the uh, sky, it should have all kinds, all eight kinds of merits, eight kinds of good qualities. However, the quality of the water is different. When I was in Africa, I really wanted to I really um, felt there should be some rain over there. But even when it was dark and with clouds, but no raindrops would fall from the sky. So that's the first example. The raindrops, when it first generated from the clouds, they're of no difference. They're of good qualities. But once they drop down to the, uh, to the ground, then there are different flavors and different uh, qualities to it. 
or there is a different change to the quality. The next verse says that when the waters of the eight noble fold paths rain from the uh, heart of a vast cloud of compassion, they will also acquire many kinds of tastes, but the different grounds of beings uh, make up by the different beings make up. So over here it says that the eightfold path taught by the Buddha. In fact, the teaching is exactly just like the uh, rain that has that is endowed with the eight beneficial qualities. So the teachings given by the Buddha is of great equanimity. It is generated out of his vast and great compassion. There's really no difference. However, because of the ground of the sentient being's mind, the uh, different elements of the sentient being's mind and different capacity, then the way that they perceive the teaching will be different. For example, the ones with the um, disposition of Shravaka, they would receive the Eightfold Path to the teachings of the Shravaka, that is the Twelve Nidanas, and then to the Bodhisattva dispositions, then they would perceive it as the teachings of uh, the selfless phenomena and selfless self. Though the Buddha probably, though the Buddha gives a teaching that is the same, however, out of the different dif dispositions and the capacities of sentient beings, they receive it differently. The way that they would work with their afflictions would be different as well. According to the Avatamsaka Sutra, it says that the, the ring of the correct dharma that's bestowed by the Tadagata is the one flavor of the great compassion. However, because of the sentient beings are of different capacities, therefore, there are differences of the uh, Dharma teachings stated. The rain that's bestowed from the sky is of the same. However, the way that is received is different, just as how the Dharma teaching given by the Buddha is of great equanimity, but the way that the sentient beings receive is different. So we should understand that. Over here it talks about how out of the different vases of receiving the Dharma, then the Dharma is uh, then of uh, uh, various teachings or different into divided into different categories and different teachings. The rain could be beneficial to some group and be harmful to another. According to Chandragirti, um, it is said that uh, the teachings given by Chantrakirti could be beneficial to a group of people and if harmful to another. It is not to say that Chantrakirti's teaching is harmful. Rather, it is to say that Chantrakirti's teaching could destroy the uh, wrong views of some and could only encourage more wrong views to the ones who's not in, who's not capable of receiving the teaching and the next verse in terms of the effortless manifestation 
in terms of the uh, kind of manifestation of the rain that is effortless and same as the Buddha's teaching is also effortless. There are the three aspects or three examples to demonstrate this. The first one says that those of devotion towards the Supreme Vehicle those who are neutral and those with uh, aggression and three are the three groups of beings who are similar to humans, peacocks, and the hungry ghosts. So those are the three examples. The great vehicle, the most supreme vehicle, the Mahayana would bestow the rain from clouds. The kinds of audience that receive the rain are divided into the three categories. For example, there are the ones who generated great and pure faith to receive the Mahayana teaching, and they would be able to completely receive the teachings. This is the beings of the first group. And then the second group are the ones who are of the middling capacity. They are rather quite neutral. They can receive the teaching and they don't have to receive the teaching, so they don't really have a preference. They don't really care much. They probably only care about their enjoyments and entertainments in life, but they don't really care about the Dharma. And then the third category are the ones who do not have any faith whatsoever. In fact, not only that they don't have any faith, they would generate aggression. So they have this wrong view. So after stating those three categories, how do they correspond with the three examples? The first group, the ones whom generated a great faith, are the group of sentient beings, um, particularly human beings, receiving the raindrops and they would be very happy. And the middling group, the neutral group, are just like peacocks. And the ones not only that they don't take delights in belief of the Dharma, rather they generate great aggression. So those group of people are considered as hungry ghosts. And later on, there are detailed explanations of each categories. So we see that there's the first group of whom generated a great faith and uh, delight uh, in receiving the Dharma and in receiving the Dharma or the rain. And then the second group are considered as the group with kind of a neutral attitude, just like peacock. And the third one is uh, the ones without any faith, just like, hung, uh, just like hungry ghosts, um, also would generate anger on top of that. Over here, it says that at the end of spring, when there are no clouds, human beings and birds that are rarely fly, um, when rain is falling in summertime, the craving spirits suffer. So there are some explanations over here. This memoir, this memoir of a dream, for those of you who are dreaming right now, it's important for you to wake up. Maybe it will wake you up. I really hope that you can also write journals so that later on you can record all the virtuous deeds that you've done in this dreamlike life. <laughs> all the dharma that you've accumulated, the, uh, the dharma teachings that you've studied, and so on. That would be meaningful. Now let's look at the verse. Over here in the verse it says that at the end of the spring, or beginning of summer, usually we would say that there are three months uh, in spring, summer, autumn, and winter. This is a way of recording the various seasons. Another way of 
Another way of looking at the seasons is that、um, there are three seasons and、uh, four months. Designated to each of the seasons, and in summer and spring, summer and spring is considered as one season. There are the way of、um, uh, looking at the weather or looking at the year in two seasons as well. There are the different categories. Over here, it says that at the end of spring, when there are no clouds, people would not be happy. People would suffer. And whenever there is rain, then they would be delighted. In India, since in many of the areas, in fact, it is considered that they、uh, thrive based on agriculture. Therefore, they really count on the weather. On top of that, there are times in India where they would suffer from various drought or the dry seasons, same as in Africa. In Tibet, we would say that the raindrops in spring is as expensive and rare as oils. So it is quite precious to have some spring rain. Therefore, over here it says that whenever it rains in the spring, people would be delighted. And then the second example is that the birds that rarely fly. Specifically, in this text, it refers to the peacocks. The peacocks, they're、uh, the peacocks, unlike eagles and so on and so forth,、uh, they do not fly in the sky. Therefore. For such kind of bird that doesn't necessarily travel in sky and、uh, um, depending on their、uh, flight skills, therefore they do not generate any suffering or delight whenever it's raining or not raining. So they abide at a state of neutral neutrality. When I Observe the sparrows that live under my roof. I notice that the the sparrows enjoy drizzles of of rain. Rather, they do not enjoy、uh, storms. But for peacock, they don't really care about raining or not. Peacock has this quality that when there is spring thundering, the peacocks will be happy. According to the Tibetan teachings, that's the description of peacock. Another term to describe pe-、uh, peacocks is that they, the ones who take delights of thundering. It is not really a, 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 a all per, an all pervasive description of the peacocks or of the birds,、um, nor the people. In fact, not everyone would take delights in rain. There are the group of people, for example, mar-、uh, farmers. They definitely would take delight when.、Uh, When it rains in the springtime, especially if it is dry for a long period of time. On the other hand, we don't really necessarily like lots of rain. For example, the flood in、um, in Henan and、uh, so on. Not not that we all enjoy great rains, but for farmers. And even the herders, we really like raining seasons in the spring because if it rains, then the crops would grow or the grass would grow, so that the yaks、uh, would be fulfilled with all the、uh, the、uh, the grass that's growing on the land. 
特别舒服。我都上去下去，一般都是不打扇，就是如果不打扇的话。I myself, I really like drizzles. Whenever I uh commute from my home to uh over here, I really enjoy to walk in the drizzles. It feels very refreshing. In Tibet, we say that the rain is really. Uh, is really the best for the livelihood of all beings. So over here we can see that for majority of people,、uh, they would take the lights when it rains. However, for the peacocks, they do not take any reference.、Uh, they do not take any preference. But when it comes to the hungry ghost. Because of their karma, whenever it rains in the summer season, the hungry, the the raindrops would then manifest as hot, heated sand rains. Therefore, the hungry ghosts would rather suffer gravely. Therefore, they would、um, avert very much to that of the summer rain. So similarly, let's correspond the meaning to its examples. In terms of the great compassionate uh, uh, gathering of clouds, the wondrous teaching of the Dharma. That is the rain of Amrita when it appears in this world for the beings who take delights in taking the teachings of the correct Dharma. They would be extremely happy. Beings at the ordinary、uh, state, when they hear the teaching of the dar, when they hear the Dharma teachings, the genuine Dharma teachings, they are the ones who、uh, would generate great faith, and their、um, their hair would even stand up. So there are people whom, upon hearing the teaching of compassion, of emptiness, or even seeing the statues and pictures of Buddha, or even something very simple, a Dharma, te- a Dharma book, a Dharma text, there are beings whom would right away generate great faith and would generate great delight. <coughs> And they would cherish the Dharma teaching very much. They would feel that it is such of a rare opportunity for me to receive this teaching after eons of suffering in samsara. There are people like such. So over here, the first group of beings are like that, and the second group of beings are the ones in neutral state. When there are Dharma teachings, they. Are of a neutral state, and there,、uh, when there are not dharma teachings, they don't necessarily feel anything either. There are the fellow dharma practitioners who feel that oh, there are teachings, okay. There's no teaching today. There's no class, okay. So they don't really feel anything specific when it comes to dharma teachings. They would feel that oh, it's good. There's no teachings. I can take some rest. I can take I can take some break. When I observe certain of the staff members, the other day I asked. The other day, I asked some、um, staff member who were sent to certain other places,、um, and then initially I felt that. Initially, I felt a little bit.、Um, uh, regret that he doesn't have the opportunity to listen to the entering the way of the great vehicle.、Uh, and then, when I asked him so how he is and so on and so forth, he said it is good. And he started asking me what I'm doing.、Uh, I told him I'm giving the teaching on the entering the way of the great vehicle. He said, "Oh, is it good?" And then that's it. He didn't really investigate any further. 
further. So I felt a little bit better. I don't feel a sense of um, a regret anymore since he doesn't really have a feeling uh, of regret or longing for the Dharma anyways. And then the third group of beings whom have the wrong views, they would not only um, not taking any delight in the Dharma, rather they generate a sense of aggression towards the Dharma. When we studied the uh, when we studied the Lotus Sutra, there are the group of beings. Um, there are the group of beings uh, when I was giving the teaching of the Lotus Sutra uh, who got overzealous and they try to find faults as much as they can. So we can see that there are beings like that. There are people creating the difficult conditions for the Dharma. It had happened numerous times during the time of the Buddha when the Buddha attained enlightenment and started giving teachings uh, on Vulture Peak. A group of beings were extremely happy, especially the ones made great connection to the Dharma. And then there are a group of people at that time, especially some herders back then, out of various reasons unknown, they were not happy about the Buddha giving teaching at that time. You probably don't have much of the feeling right now to what I'm talking about, but whenever it's your turn to give teachings to the others, you would definitely feel more uh, vivid about the descriptions over here. There are people whom would be very delighted about the Dharma teaching, and then there are people whom don't really feel anything at all. And then another group of people <coughs> a group of people whom would generate anger, for example, the group of beings whom don't feel happy nor sad if there are teachings, uh, there are kampos and kamos. You've, I believe the Kimpos and Kimmels may have more of a vivid uh, feeling about this teaching over here since you know that there are a group of people who you've benefited and uh, they've also tried to repay your kindness. And then there are a group of beings whom rather would create difficulties and it would be difficult to deal with. Especially at the end of the term, the study term, there are students from each uh, from each class. There are a few whom are not welcomed to be transferred into other classes at all or any class and then there are the ones uh, whom are very much um, welcomed and even the Kampos and Kimmels don't want to let them go from their class they would hold on to them and, and telling the others no 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 this student is mine we can see that how every sentient beings are of such variety of different capacities and dispositions. Everyone's so different and it is so complicated. Everyone's connection is so, diff so complicated, even more complicated than uh, the internet. So the group of sentient beings that we like or we dislike, even the kind of sentient beings whom slander us for days and nights continuously, we should not see them, we should not see them with anger and aggression. 
The Buddha said that we should not generate any sense of aversion towards any sentient beings. If you were to generate aggression to any sentient beings, you are not considered as the genuine Shramana. One should not generate aggression even towards the burnt wood. If you were to generate aggression to a piece of burnt wood, you would be reborn in uh, lower realms. So the beings whom slandered the virtuous teachers, the great masters, the three jewels. On one hand, I understand that we definitely would generate a sense of uh, sadness in our hearts. However, we shouldn't generate any aversion and aggression towards those people who slander those great masters. We should either uh, walk away, or if you have the capacity, and I think it is necessary sometimes to try to stop them from doing whatever uh, they're doing to slander the great masters. This is the action of a genuine Dharma practitioner. In our world, in our society, we see that there are people of different capacities and different um, temperaments. But it's quite important that you should not be influenced by the others and practice whatever you were taught. And now let's look at the next verse where it talks about um, the way it is not discriminatory. When releasing a delug of um, uh, heavy drops or hurling down hailstones and thunderbolts as well as Vajra fire and uh, heated sand. A cloud does not heat any tiny beings or those who have sought shelter in the mountain. Likewise, the clouds of knowledge and compassion does not heed whether its vast and subtle drops will purify the afflictions or increase dormant tendencies towards holding the view of a self. So the sentient beings with their capacity or with their habitual tendencies, when the raindrops are pouring down, such kind of sentient beings would rather feel the heated, heated um, hailstones, burning, uh, burning uh, sands and uh, heated hailstones. And then for the group of people who are rather very tiny, such as little insects and uh, uh, bees and so on and so forth, when there are big hills coming in, it could kill lots of those insects. In the past few days, we also had lots of uh, uh, thunderstorms as well as uh, hails. When I look at my backyard, in a short period of time, all the flowers uh, were then beaten to the ground, also lots of the insects, tiny bees, and so on and so forth. They all died at that time. But after a few days, after a short period of time, they all revived again. They, they started thriving again, the, the flowers and vegetations. And then the little insects started to come back. So it shows that the tiny beans could be 
harmed. But for the kind of tiny bees that um, take shelter in caves, in mountains, in forests, then they won't be harmed. Therefore, over here it says that the clouds may not affect those of the um, tiny insects that sought shelter in the mountains and caves and forests. Just as a sentient beings, in this world, it is not that the raindrops have such kind of um, intention to harm that of the beings of hungry ghost realm. However, they would naturally be harmed. Whenever it's raining in our world, we can contemplate how such kind of raindrops would then be perceived as heated sands and um, the heated hails falling onto them. So that would generate great suffering and then anger. Looking at hails and uh, raindrops, in fact, it doesn't affect the kind of animals and human beings in this world as much. However, it could create create lots of suffering to that of the hungry ghost beings. It seems that we are led into this very much vivid examples that's described by Maitreya. Sometimes it's rain, sometimes it's clouds, and sometimes it's Indra's palace. This is the kind of vivid teachings uh, from the enlightened ones. Also, the next ones um, over here, it says that so the kind of sentient beings, in fact, are of the capacity to receive the teachings of the Dharma, then they would take delight of uh, taking the, the ring of the Dharma. It is not that the Buddha, while giving the Dharma teachings out of his great compassion, has a sense of differentiating the different capacities of sentient beings. Rather, there are the beings um, that have different capacity of receiving the teachings. And over here it says that the different capacities, including the ones have the disposition of receiving the profound, subtle, and vast teachings. And then there the are the sentient beings only has the um, disposition of grasping onto a solid existence of self. And for those beings, they would not be able to receive any benefits. On one hand, it seems that the Buddha is turning the Dharma wheel and it should be beneficial to all. However, there are beings who can receive the benefits and the ones who can't. From the sutra, sometimes we can see that uh, only certain arhats or only certain the shravakas attain arhathood or liberation, and uh, there are um, more, much more of the numbers described. In the uh, in the beings with the disposition of Mahayana would be able to receive liberation and so on and so forth. There are the different numbers recorded in the sutra at the end of the sutra, whomsoever attained certain fruition. Similarly, uh, when we look at this world, there are the trees that. Easy for them to observe, uh, 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 absorb the water, absorb the rain. Therefore, they would grow faster. And then there are the ones that's not very proficient in absorbing the raindrops. Therefore, they grow much slower. Similarly, there are the beans who can absorb the dharma much faster. 
And there are the beings who can't absorb the uh, Dharma teachings as fast or, or proficiently. Sometimes I think to myself that Ponsu Rinpoche stayed in this world for 72 years. He, though, only studied for six years. But he gave the teaching for a long period of time, even through the difficult time of the Cultural Revolution. During his abiding in this world, there were people who were able to receive the teachings from him and um, receive the teachings much more prof proficiently, and that there are the ones who only come to visit him once or twice. And on top of that, there are the ones whom not only not contributing to his Dharma propagation, but created great difficulties in the revealing of his terma. From the angle of uh, the Dharma teacher, in fact, they did not differentiate the disciples. They expounded the teachings with great equanimity. There are sentient beings, there are the students whom would feel that, oh, the teacher's being really nice to me, and the teacher uh, would give me blessings even upon seeing me, and the teacher would bless me right away, and the teacher's giving me very specific attention and so on and so forth. And that's really from the perception of the ones without any sense of security. But as a teacher, in fact, they would extend the unbiased um, benefit of the Dharma with a sense of equanimity. There are beings whom would feel that, why are you being so nice to the other disciples but not to me? I am also your disciple. So there are the beings of different kinds of uh, perceptions. From the biographies of the various masters, I can see these kinds of students also exist in their descriptions. And sometimes when I read their biographies, it feels very much vivid to me as if I am already seeing the situations, especially when it comes to how the um, Dharma teacher has the great compassion that is equal to everyone, but people would receive it in a very in very different ways. For example, the biography of Long Chenpa, it is very telling. I've translated Long Chenpa's biography into Chinese. You should be able to read it. The Buddha, the Dharma teacher, in fact, they don't have any bias. But because of the different merit, the different karma, then the way that people receive the teachings are very different. According to a sutra that's called the um, prosperity, uh, prosperous manifestation of the Tathagatas, where it is says that just as how the rain has only of one taste, however, the way that it's being received is different, though that it is propagated, oh, though the rain is um, Though the rain doesn't have any bias or preference, rather would moist whatever is there, similarly, the Tathagatas would also practice um, or carry out their actions of the Dharma 
without any bias, without any preference. I kept on stressing the point that the Dharma doesn't have a master. There is no one that owns the Dharma. The Buddha doesn't have an owner. Um, and the Lama doesn't have owner. So if you have faith and diligence, you can have the Dharma. If you have faith, then you can take the teacher as your teacher. There are people who have the opportunity to listen to the teacher um, to, to listen directly to the teacher and they're the ones though you have faith but maybe you don't have the opportunity to attend the teachings um, over there right in front of the teacher but if you have faith then you would be able to receive the blessings and the teachings and would be able to regard the teacher as your, your lama, as your teacher. Also, such kind of blessings is spontaneous. It is not... Um, it is not conditioned by a certain effort. You can ask for... You can ask for uh, blessings at any time. It is not that the teacher or the Buddhas or the Three Jewels has to put into certain effort so that you will be able to receive the teaching, uh, the receive the blessings. It is not like that at all. Uh, now the next verse, uh, connection with the property conducive to eliminating suffering and how it corresponds to extinguishing the fire. There are lots of wildfires going on. If there are the great rings that could be uh, poured down to the wildfire, then they would be extinguished. Similarly, the sentient beings that's uh, suffering from the fire of their afflictions, such kind of beginningless and endless suffering in this beginningless and endless samsara, the sentient beings uh, could be found in the five types, the um, celestial beings, the asuras sometimes are combined as one group and sometimes the hungry ghost and uh, um, the hungry Ghost and uh, the hell realm sometimes is combined as one realm. Therefore, over here it says the five instead of six. Some beings would say that, well, I feel samsara is wonderful. It's so happy. It's full of all kinds of happiness. I have a family. I have property. I have work, and I am uh, having all kinds of enjoyments. Why do you say that samsara is suffering? I am quite happy. But over here, the example is that, in fact, there is no happiness in samsara. Just like that, you can't find any fragrance in feces. The fire over here that creates suffering can be like the uh, the suffering in samsara is compared to the fire that is beginningless and endless, is ongoing suffering that's being burned. Also, um, compared to the example of how there is no fragrance uh, within feces and how a wound that is being created by the great fire or being slit by sharp blades or sprinkle salt on top of fresh wound. 
我们的这种这个痛苦呢，就是应该依靠佛法来可以灭啊。就是现在众生很。However, we can definitely extinguish all of those fire of suffering through the actual practice of the Dharma. For human beings, if we don't have any spiritual,、uh, if we don't have any spirituality, if we don't have any faith, then it's really difficult for us to continue our life、um, uh, without suffering. Therefore, we have to、um, definitely practice on the spiritual path to eliminate the suffering. The next one is talking about wisdom, where over here it talks about how even the celestial beings would come to the end of their life. There is the death and transmigration. Similarly, human beings also suffer from all kinds of strife. The four types of suffering,、uh, or the three types of suffering, suffering of suffering, suffering of change, and、uh, the eight types of suffering: suffering of、uh, illness, suffering of death, and、uh, suffering of、uh, parting from the loved ones, and so on. All kinds of、uh, categories of sufferings. 啊，等等，就这些的话呢，就是实际上是也是像像水泡一样的，就是不会呢，就是对。Even if such kind of being is of a high social status, the kings, emperors, prime ministers,、um, the ones with、uh, lots of wealth and so on, they may be considered as the、uh, the celestial beings in the human realm, but even the real celestial beings, they would come to Their lifespan would come to an end too. For human beings, they would strive to be、um, a certain leader, a certain、um, someone with a, a great authority. Even among our sangha, even among the practitioners, there are the ones who strive to be a dharma teacher, strive to be, uh, uh, strive to be a、uh, kempo、uh, or kemo. And if they can't, they would feel that oh, they're just out of jealousy. Therefore, they don't like me. It is only that they don't,、um, they don't respect me because、uh, I am so much better than they are. So there are people like that too,、uh, even in our group. Uh, 就是那是什么样呢？就是要随着这个自己前世的这种这个具身的智慧，然后呢，就是同时也是我们今生当中后天的，通过这个文思修行的这种。However, such kind of wisdom that's accumulated from um maybe previous karmic retribution or in this lifetime, then we can come to the kind of recognition and realization of wisdom. Through our systematic study, through our practice, and through the detailed understanding of how everything that is defiled is of the nature of suffering. What's the nature? What? Where does the, the nature、uh, of suffering come from? It comes from the accumulation of suffering, and how can we eliminate? Such kind of suffering, then we can tread on the path that would lead to the、um, the、um, extinguishing of the suffering, and then that is called such kind of extinguishing of the suffering is called the truth of cessation. After knowing such, we can understand. We definitely have to seek for wisdom. This is so important on our path. With wisdom, we would be able to part from this samsara. We would be able to alleviate from the sufferings of the from this samsara. According to Nirvana Sutra, it says that the sentient beings treading in the great darkness. Enduring the myriad kinds of suffering, it is only you, the world honored one, who can lead all of the sentient beings to part from the great suffering. Therefore, you are renowned as the one with great compassion. 
Out of all the compassionate teachings from the Buddha, the most crucial and the most fundamental is that of the teaching of the Four Noble Truths. Only the teaching of the Four Noble Truths, the sentient beings can then be alleviated from their suffering. And then after knowing the Four Noble Truths, Let's look at the noble truth. Over here it says that in the case of disease, one needs to diagnose it, to remove it, uh, remove its cause, attain the happy state of health, and rely on the suitable medicine. Similarly, one needs to recognize suffering, remove its cause, come in touch with its cessation, and rely on the suitable path. This is the teaching that I quoted a few times before. This is a really important teaching, really important uh, stanza. It says that over here, as a doctor, if you want to cure the illness of the uh, patient, then you have to first of all know what kind of illness it is. You have to diagnose the illness. And you have to know the cause of the illness. Does it uh, occur because of cold, and because of uh, moist, and because of various reasons, and so on? And then after knowing that, you have to know the prescription, the method of alleviate uh, such kind of illness from the sentient beings. On, not only having the prescription, but you actually have to have the uh, medicine. It is applicable to all kinds of doctors, the Chinese traditional medicine doctor, the Tibetan traditional medicine doctor, and the, um, the Western medicine doctor. In fact, they all have to know the method of cure, of to give a cure to such illness. How about the corresponding meanings to it? First of all, you have to know the suffering. Is it the suffering of this worldly being? Is it suffering in this world? And then know the cause for such kind of suffering. You have to know the karma and affliction. And then after that, you have to know the path, the five paths, the ten bumis. And then you have to know about the merit of cessation. You have to know the suffering, know the cause of suffering, know the merit of the cessation, the cessation of suffering, and then the path that would lead you to such a kind of cessation. So that is why it is said that uh, you have to first recognize suffering, remove its cause, and then come in touch with its cessation to know the, the merit of its cessation and then rely on the suitable path to attain such a cessation of suffering. In the Chinese Tripitaka, there is a teaching there is a sutra called the Buddha's teaching on the um, on the uh, teachings given by a doctor, where it talks about how the medicines, how, how the doctor would diagnose various illness and then give the prescription and then so on as, uh, and and so on and how that correspond to the dharma, uh, how it corresponds to the teaching of the Buddha, especially when it comes to. To the suffering and cessation of suffering, um, the sutra's title in Chinese is that the Buddha's teaching on the example of of uh, a doctor. In a shastra, it also says that suffering is just like 
an illness. And the cause of such illness is the cause of suffering. The method of alleviate such illness is the method of alleviating suffering, and the cessation refers to the cure of such illness. According to the Sutra of Teachings, it says that the moon can be hot, the sun can be cold, but the Buddha's teaching on the Four Noble Truths will not change. So what is the truth? The truth of suffering would not be changed, cannot be changed, will not be changed, same as the other Four Noble Truths the other three of the Four Noble Truths. And for people who attained any kinds of insights and realization, they would definitely agree to that. This is really a natural law. So I hope all of you would uptake the teaching of the Four Noble Truths into your heart and uh, uh, cherish it. In Buddha Tantra Shastra and other sutras and, and shastras, you definitely see lots of really good teachings within it. There are people who can receive great teachings every day and receive various rules from each class. That is why it is so important to attend classes, and that is why it's so important to engage in systematic studies. In uh, a few days ago, we in fact already completed the uh, teaching of the Sutra of Great Liberation, and I think it was of a great um, dependent origination, and it can be propagated largely in the future, uh, uh, widely in the future, not only in here, but everywhere in this world. This is really um, the out of the, um, the auspicious dependent origination. This time, when I look at all of you attending this class on Wuthara Tantra Shastra, your interest and your dedication is very encouraging. When I look at it, I am very pleased. Sometimes I think that I also put lots of effort into preparing the class and into the giving of the class on top of all the other things I have to do. Many of the Dharma teachers, they can take turns to give teachings, but I myself, I can't take turns with anyone. So I have to give teachings every day. There are people over here, maybe you haven't received any degrees of, or certificates in Larongar, but if you engaged in all kinds of teachings over here, and whenever it's time for you to uh, get back to the society or the whatever community that you're from, you would notice that you have the ability to propagate the Dharma and to help the other sentient beings and bestowing and bestowing the uh, nectar of Dharma to the ones in need. Um, so after your your effort will definitely not be in vain. Let's stop here today.